Hey guys, I'm at Tiny Leaf Farm in South Florida, and this is a really, really cool microgreens farm that is just doing a lot of innovative things. So I'm really excited to give you guys a tour of Tiny Leaf and introduce you to Cassie and Ty today. Hey guys, thanks so much for having me at the farm. You guys have a really, really beautiful, really cool farm and I'm really excited to share everyone uh, what you guys are doing. So I'd love to hear how you guys got into microgreens, how Tiny Leaf became a farm and yeah, just maybe your backstory of, of how it became what it is today. Awesome, General. Firstly, thank you for pulling into uh, Tiny Leaf Microgreen Farm here in Fort Lauderdale. Um, yeah, started microgreen farming about three years ago, um, stemmed from an idea uh, between the twos of us, uh, we've been working on yachts for the last 12, 12 to 15 years, so we decided uh, we wanted to set some, some roots land-based here in South Florida. So, yeah, naturally speaking, I'm a chef, and uh, I've been using microgreens for the last 12 to 15 years as I've been cooking. Amazing. So, yeah, just decided that we'd give it a bash. We bought our first rack and started in our spare bedroom at yep. home, and uh, here you are, man. It took us three years. Here we both, are. Both wow, both yeah, so three, three years to get to, to this point. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. Now, yeah, yeah for, for those that... Uh, I uh, haven't seen, this is a pretty large scale microgreens farm. You said you're doing about 800 trays a week now? Yeah, between five to 800 a week in terms of plants and plants and move around there. Um, yeah, around there. Yeah, we've obviously just got our GAP certifications as well. So we plan on expanding the farm further and building more of our M flow systems just to kind of utilize our 1,800 squares here. We're kind of going vertical and going to try yeah. triple production in the farm space as well. That's amazing. Yeah, I've been in uh, South Florida for the last few days and um, I was working at a park nearby and I was honestly shocked at how many large, like massive yachts are in the Fort Lauderdale, Miami area. So you yeah. guys definitely have uh, a really unique niche. Like how much of your business would you say is, 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 is like the yacht catering kind of market? Amount. I mean, yeah, I it's mean, kind of how we started. It's really, it was a huge part of our business in the beginning because it was our industry. Yeah. And we had a lot of support from our industry, which was really nice. But I, I don't really feel like this direction we're moving. We, well, yeah, I mean, we're always we do a chunk loyal, of our business from loyal them. to our yacht chefs. Yeah, yeah. I'm a yacht chef. So Cassie screams at me when I try growing red vein sorrel. That's not profitable <laughs> because like, we're not making any money on this. So. Yeah, but here we are. A lot of yacht chefs are using more bespoke micros. So you know, we, we still cater to the needs of speciality crop. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's a great, great place to have started business. Obviously, we within our realms of working on yachts, we develop good networks of provisioners, suppliers. So yeah. they kind of grandfathered us into the production side of things or yeah, the distribution side we, of things. Used, we work with a lot of yacht provisioners, yeah. which is like a, a wholesale. Wholesale, yeah. yeah and yeah. then we also work with wholesale now. Yeah, I guess we, we're branching more towards a wholesale market. Yeah, for sure. Obviously with GAP, that gives us more freedom to focus more time and energy on crop development and production here. Yeah, the fun production. stuff. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah no, for sure. Yeah, it's kind of crazy because I see this farm, like you guys did this in three years. This took me many, many years to, to get to the space where, where you're at now. I think it was probably about you don't have him, though. this capacity. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. You guys are definitely, <laughs> definitely <little> working hard. <laughs> Just going all, all, not all day, nonstop. Yes. That, that's how you know you love it, though. Yeah. Like that's how you know you found something you really love because when you do, when you just do it all the time. And that's always on your mind. It's like there's a reason for that. It's not like you're forcing yourself to do. You want to do that. For sure, for sure. So. Yeah. Um, it, it's great to find your passion in life. That's Thanks, so, so important. Um, but I see you also have like beautiful edible flowers behind you. Um, I love to hear like how you got into that, who the customers are for, for edible flowers. Cause yeah, I don't even know what that is. Like that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah so this is, I'm this sorry. Yeah, this is an <laughs> Egyptian star flower. The Egyptian star um, flower. Interesting. Typically known as a penta. So yeah, I mean, these are great for a lot of pastry chefs. Um, can you do me a favor and grab us a Fiesta blend quickly? Yeah. Cassie's going to run off and show you one of our Fiesta blends. But yeah, we do uh, mixed edible flower boxes. Um, honestly, we're going to turn this whole rack into flowers. And wow. as we scale the business, there's a huge market for edible flowers that's uh, kind of untapped. And the price points on edible flowers are really, really pretty solid as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so one of our Fiesta blends. This, this is, uh, is something we sell a lot of. We do like a microgreen mix with flowers. Wow. It's yeah, that's, yes, wow, that is beautiful. It's yeah. Big oh, that's a huge setup for a whole oh. is good. Just focus there. So awesome. really a ton of our flowers go into these Fiesta blends. Wow. Yeah, that is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, so we grow about, you know, we do flowers in season, our marigolds, our pentas, our violas and pansies. Violas just came out of season, but our pansies are still available. 
And uh, yeah, just a good variety of flowers for our chefs. A lot of uh, kind of chefs use flour and flowers in pastries or in cocktails. So we see a lot of bartenders and uh, kind of pastry chefs using flowers and a lot of desserts and, and yeah. drinks and dehydrations and all sorts. So yeah, yeah flowers are great. Great little addition to any migraine farm. And yeah. uh, it's definitely a cash crop right there. So for no, sure. A lot of people don't want to deal with them. But yeah, I know. <laughs> like, like it looks like they're extremely healthy. So I'm curious on like pest management because that seems to be one of the biggest challenges, especially here in South Florida where like, you know, you have year round pest yeah, potential. We have aphid issues. Right. Yeah. It kind of is one of those things like we don't spray, we don't want to spray. So yeah. when they get, they technically, like it's really just the flowers get aphids. Yeah. So other than the sorrel, we rarely have any other issues in the farm. I and mean, when, we, when we get aphids, we just get rid of the flowers. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's unfortunate, sure. it just but it's just, again. we just start over. Yeah, yeah. 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 Have you ever they're tried? Seasonal anyways, you know, they're always, we're always changing yeah. the flowers. So it's, we use neem oils and all natural stuff, but nothing, nothing that's uh, of pesticides. But once they're in, they're yeah, they're really in. Yeah. Hard yeah. to get rid of if you're not going to use poison. But also, I mean, yeah. if you look at the lifespan of a flower, you know, we can kind of grow it from seed to seed to harvest, so to say, in microgreen terminologies. You know, you're getting a good six to eight weeks out of a flower, and then we're starting new seedlings. Oh, and okay, we're getting nice. new production out of flowers as well, because yeah. yeah, we kind of don't want to over over harvest they start they start not budding as much as they usually do so yeah you kind sure. of have a lifespan of a, of a flower anyway so once we they generally attack a lot of the older flowers as well so our marigolds get hit so we'll just change our flowers and start new seedlings and yeah of that's there. amazing have you ever tried you doing uh ipm like integrated pest man for using like ladybugs things like that we do, yeah we yes. use loads of ladybugs yeah um, so yeah. Does, it, but it, does it help control or get rid of is get it get rid of Oh, okay. I would say the ladybugs need they need a food supply, so yeah. they won't breed and they won't reproduce and they won't stay in the farm unless they have a food supply. So we have to we have to have bugs in here for them to stay here. Correct. Yeah. But also they didn't we haven't really used them in this farm. We use them a lot in the shipping containers. Mm. It was much easier to have them in the can, in the shipping containers because they didn't go any they wouldn't go anywhere. Yeah. yeah. They had so a fair chance contained. of survival because we have to open the doors and rinse out. So yeah. little guys didn't want to be there anymore could fly out. So, yeah. yeah, if there's no food, they, they want to leave. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. They're, yeah. Like, they're done, you know? For sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah for sure. No, interesting. That's that's really cool to know. So it looks like you have quite a few. I see marigolds. I see pansies. Pinters, marigolds, pansies. Um, yeah, right now, that's our four. Right yeah. Three or four varieties right now. Earlier we just in the got season, rid of... we had violas. We had snapdragons. We used to do, when we were outdoor growing, we had um, uh, butterfly peas and... Yeah purple basil flower, but it's hard to do inside because they want to vine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's just, they have limitations with... So we had a whole outdoor, we had 12 beds and creeper walls, so we had a lot of flowers and stuff. Yeah. So I think as we scale, if we move into a new operation, we'll kind of designate a space where we can strictly focus on uh, production of more edible flowers. Cass is going to shoot me in the chest. <laughs> she doesn't want to move. She's like, we just got you. I don't want to. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hear you on that. Yeah. Um, so in, ter like, in terms of like one of my main concerns on edible flowers, why I didn't do it is I couldn't make the numbers work as well as microgreens. Gotcha. So how does that kind of work for you guys in terms of like, do you find that just the price point's so high that it, it works really well or like the labor is, is, is an issue or not yeah, an issue? Yeah, look, flowers take a lot of work. We do pruning. Uh, weekly, we repotting, we replanting. They take more nutrients, um, so yeah, they definitely are a more labor labor of love in terms of flower production. I just think we have a good price point for the flowers, so we make it up in the uh, sales. Yeah, yeah. you're selling twenty four ounce clam for forty dollars. So yeah, you know, I, cool thing about flowers is you're not you know harvesting a micro is you get rid of your flat. You harvest your flowers, and it promotes more growth. So yeah, you do get a lot once you get your seedlings to a stage of flower production, then uh, it's a continuous harvest and. Yeah, we're not trying to do too many flowers. We'd rather focus on Fiesta blends, which is our main seller to some yeah. of our wholesale clients. Yeah. So all of our yacht chefs who we typically focus on for flowers, you know, if they're buying four edible flowers, it's 250 bucks, and we're getting 10 of those a week. It's an additional $2,000 in revenue just on yeah. flowers. So That's yeah, it's amazing. not a huge focus, but it's definitely another another revenue stream for a marketing business to kind of focus on. And I can guarantee you anywhere you are, you're going to sell flowers. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. When I started uh, 10 years ago, like edible flowers just really weren't, they weren't very popular, yeah, yeah, you sure. know? And it, it, and one thing that's really important for any sort of micro concern, whether you're starting out or established business is like keep up with the trends mm -hmm. because like, for example, um, it, you know, wheatgrass as an example, used to be so, so popular when yeah. I started. Yeah. Same thing with like buckwheat microgreens, which you guys may have never even heard yeah, of or we, seen. We oh, okay. But yeah, yeah. Buck, yeah, but there's just not there's not enough demand, right? No, there really isn't. Yeah, and Sunny's also kind of you know you look at Donny Greens and the boys that are pumping out sunflowers. They're still, like still a good market for them. Not, I don't know. It's not a, a lot of people want them. Either. Yeah, yeah. I, I found that there's there's demand for sunflower, but it's um, 
well, the best ways to use it is in mixes. Yeah, exactly. because in mixes, like people aren't like, oh, it's sunflower. I can get that anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a unique blend that has sunflower, Correct. maybe has some flowers, has some yeah, yeah, amaranth, yeah. or whatever you know, whatever works yeah, well yeah. together. And they're nice and bulky. They like bulk up your mixes. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah, they're, they're a good cost effective way to. Same thing with pea shoots. Yeah, they're sure. a good cost effective way to like add weight to your mixes when yeah. you have more expensive items that yeah. may be we, making it not as we fly through advantageous. we fly through pea shoots, man. Yeah, yeah. We just can't, yeah. can't keep up with enough of them. Yeah, the peas look the peas look beautiful. They're like uh, more like a tendril yeah, kind of. Yeah, these are tendrils. This yeah. is beautifully tendrils. We have the field pea as well, but these are just a bit more popular. Yeah, I'm going with chefs for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're just yeah. When when you take one out, they're way more beautiful than just the standard pea shoot. For sure. For yeah. sure. I like them. A lot. Yeah. Yeah, man. How do they taste compared to like just regular pea shoots? Any different? You tell us, boss man. I really don't think so. <laughs> Personally. Yeah, it's pretty cool, man. Nice earthy flavor. Very pea. Pea focused, mm. very tender. Yeah, yeah, I they're very nice well. and tender. I like that's that's uh, what I, would say. I like the I like the field peas. They grow a lot longer. Um, yeah, but cute. I feel like the shelf life on these guys. I mean, we've done tests for peas. They can stay in the fridge for three weeks and still be crisp. Mm, crisp, yeah. you know. So yeah, it's nice, nice uh, green for longevity in a fridge. Pea shoots are crazy how long they last. Yeah, right? well, yeah. yeah, they do. What's kind of the shelf life on the flowers? Do they vary depending on the variety, or is it all pretty much across Look, the board I mean, similar? Flowers, we, we treat flowers like amaranth and basil. Um, ah, got you know, it. We try to yeah. promote chefs to use them as quickly as possible. <laughs> Marigolds, however, have a long shelf life. They do. Like yeah. when we when we like pull them apart for the petals, yeah. and we like put a batch of petals in the fridge, they'll last like more than a week. Well, actually, wow. hear yeah. me out. I think. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. I think once once we pull petals off the stems and away from their actual vegetation as well, I feel like they last longer too. Mm. So once we pull them out and we make our petal mix that we put on top of our fiesta bed, for example, I feel like they have a better shelf life than just sitting on the stem. Um, I agree with you. I'm yeah. not sure what the reason is, but it's true. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Maybe just they're holding more moisture and retain more moisture on their actual host yeah. of a bud, essentially. But yeah, I just feel like they last longer in mixes. Like our fiesta blends last. A good 10, 12 days with no nice. issues on the pedals as well. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Good for long of the crops look great here. Like whatever you guys are doing is definitely working. So I'd love to, to kind of maybe go through the process of, you know, start to finish sure. what you got, how you guys are, are doing what you're doing. I know you got your, your, yeah. uh, some of your staff working in the background exactly. here. So I'd love to just see like from start to finish, what kind of the process is for, for sure. how I mean, you grow the microgreens. And, uh, there's, it seems like there's different methods. You guys are kind of in experimentation stage or transition yeah, stage, maybe are. is a better way to put it. For sure. So I'd love to like hear what worked best and you know what you're moving towards in the in the future in terms of production. For sure. I mean, we'll quickly talk you through our weekly schedule. We plant and harvest twice a week. So we harvest on Monday for Tuesday deliveries and we harvest again on Thursday for Friday deliveries. Then for any direct-to-consumer and yacht chefs, essentially we can harvest any day as long as we get an order 24 hours prior to. So we harvesting a dry microgreen, as you guys know, that is a longevity of shelf life of crops. Uh, so harvest and deliver twice a week, and we plant once, or we plant twice a week, plants on Wednesdays and Fridays as well. Nice. So yeah, it kind of keeps up with production levels. I mean, the farm is a little, a little empty right now because <laughs> Easter got the better of us. But yeah. Uh, yeah, like you guys know, we just try to try, uh, do more of a grow to order system. Um, yeah, just. Yeah, we do. We try to work grow to order. I mean, we're like a grow to order program because we don't like waste. And I don't want crops overgrowing and any kind of loss. So I'm all about variety. Cassie wants to streamline our uh, <laughs> variety of microgreens, and I think there's we other have people in here. A, also a, a, a running a running yeah. joke in the farm that uh, I, if anything, I'm up more on your side, Cassie. Like, <laughs> I, I, went, I when I started, we were growing like Sherville and all these like you know more exotic herbs yeah, that that, that yeah, we're growing Sherville, all the all the beets, golden beets, just yeah. Shard, yeah. It's we, the most hated microgreen. I love it. I think it's freaking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I liked it. It was very unique. I remember the first time someone asked me, I was like, what is Sherville? I've never heard of this French before. parsley. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's beautiful the, the, and I, like, the flavor is nice, but like... I think Sherville works great on any sort, of a, any, yeah. any sort of a fish dish. Um, you know, if you focused on a beautiful piece of halibut or a nice beautiful scallop on a puree. And you... We're off track, but for so sure... His, his, <laughs> his chef is coming out. <laughs> and sure, he, yeah. he focuses on microgreen use based on cooking yeah and yeah. we in this farm the rest of us focus on microgreen use we we we, we think about it as a grower yeah but like a it's good to have enough. both though yeah it it's good to have have it creates balance and allows like you know more creativity to form sure. in the farm sure. Sure. so it there's is a good balance but we yeah. have to reel him in you know? <laughs> yeah no for, for sure like we yeah we we came down we we ended up having like i think 10 retail products and then we had a few extra for food service yeah. so we grew maybe 10 11 crops yeah. and that was it that's and nice. that's that's what we got down to and then we just perfected those crop recipes yeah. so we maximized yield yeah. and quality 
Um, so that, that was the, uh, it's not the only approach or the best approach by any means. It's I just the it's approach pretty, we took to scale up yeah. to get to a larger scale yeah, yeah, to yeah. make it efficient. Yeah. yeah. yeah probably sure. what we need yeah. to do as well. It's probably what we need to do as well. You'd be waiting for me to say that for months. <laughs> with, 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 time, with time comes those kind of things, you yeah, know, like, right. you know, it's uh, what you've created, like I said, what you created here in three years is, is honestly amazing. I think it, by year three, I was in the in my warehouse and I remember it being like almost empty and trying to figure out like, okay, I need to figure out something, a model that's going to work because I was doing just living product. Sure. And then when I switched to cut product and started using the greens harvester, my efficiency and just like profitability, demand for product just skyrocketed and the business just took off. So it was just yeah. finding what worked best for my my market for sure. and what people wanted and, and chefs and consumers didn't want a living product the yeah. same yeah. way that maybe they did a few years in the past when, mm -hmm. at that point. So it's just finding what works best for, yeah, like for you guys when customers actually want. The trends, you know? Yeah, 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 keeping up yeah. with the trends I for sure. I think this year is kind of about that, like trying to streamline the operations and yeah, get is. our farm really dialed in and for sure. also kind of really <laughs> figure out what we want to grow and what's Look, most I mean, profitable it, and what makes most sense for the farm. Yeah, yeah. it's also trial and trial, trial We're and error. We're slowly eliminating things. We slowly. Like we've had such success growing Genovese Basil for the last two years and all of a sudden, we I mean, we still have success growing it, but our shelf life... You know, by the time we harvest it and it gets to our wholesale, I think temperature variations and how they store it, we've just had absolute chaos this year with Gen Basil. So it's just yeah. a crop I'd rather focus on growing in Oakwood, which is more stable. So we're getting rid of Gen Basil in totality right now because some just, things just don't work in wholesale. Yeah, like, you yeah. know, in bulk, right, yeah. growing it for the masses. Like it just I'd rather doesn't. focus on a commodity crop or being able to, because I mean, in rotation, if we're selling 50, 50 clams of basil a week, you know, that's three weeks worth of getting to. A bi-weekly harvest so yeah we've got almost 200 flats of basil on the farm at any given time and if we having to refund every time we sell to a wholesaler it's lots of grow space and lots of production time lots of labor lots of lots of nutrients lots of soil we have just, to be yeah. responsible for how they handle it correct and yeah. it's delicate yeah. micrograde you know? oh for sure yeah yes. like from i i had to go through that whole process yeah. of figuring out because i really wanted to sell basil and what it came down to is it's got to be bone dry when you harvest it, yeah. like no moisture yeah. at all, and then the shelf life is is much much better. Sure. Um, there's also things with nutrients you can do to increase shelf life and yeah. stuff like that. So um, we can talk about that after yeah. though. Sure. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd love to see maybe the process, and then we can we can keep chatting more. I'd love to hear about Gap after and yeah. and what your plans are for the I future. Know. But maybe let's let's see how you guys yeah. are uh, are growing. For sure. So this is kind of yeah. We got a running farm today. So this is kind of our plant plant area, so to say. We just want to set up for a plant. So we're just trying to keep everything in one space, just for trying for, to keep everything organized for you. For yeah. Seeds, seeds <laughs> today. So yeah. Basically, this is our input area. We get all our soil in here. As yeah. You can see, you've already done a the bunch of uh, tray preps. Um, so yeah, we just put our three tables and we'll smash out. Um, a big plant with the four of us um yeah through gap which we'll talk about as well we obviously have to designate certain lot numbers uh and sections for for crops so yeah i'll show you a bit of a label here so i guess yeah we're on lot 41 already so that's brock we got a harvest a, a plant date and our lot number and that essentially just allows us to grow in sections for traceability of products yeah so if anything goes wrong with because obviously uh, we have a small space so we can't really lot the farm yeah it's not a traditional one second for broccoli or one second yeah. for you know, kohlrabi or whatever. So we have to kind of think the plant we do is our lot. Yeah, for sure. So that's how we keep it organized. Yeah. So yeah this is kind of our planting area. Um, here's our germ space. Kind of ready to receive our plant today. Okay, so this is this whole area is the yeah. is the germination Double area. Germination area. Okay. So we do nice. dome germs. We you know we stack, we wait, we do all sorts of different germinations. Um, yeah. So yeah, looking pretty empty now, but we've got <laughs> well, they're, 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 getting, they're getting the work. The so boys, the be, boys, the boys yeah, are getting yeah. antsy. They're like, come yeah. on, let's go. Um, so yeah, we've got, like we, you've kind of shown us already, we've got two um, automated systems in place, our ebb and flows. Uh, we'll quickly walk you through our latest system we've just basically built. Sure. So, so uh, before we get to yeah, that, just a quick question with, with soil. So you, you get this custom blended soil yes. in? So we, and use a, then, we use a company up in uh, Pompano or Pompey. in Boynton, actually, called Atlas Peak and Soil. Oh, um, and basically what we've tried to replicate is Pro-HP. Um, yeah. So yeah, they basically put the mycorrhizae and the biofungicides in there. Um, and then, yeah, it's just a mix of 
peat moss, coconut coir, um, some actual potting soil, which we've put into the mix as well, because we feel yeah. like crops like beets and amaranth grow better in uh, that kind of mixture for us. So, yeah. It's always the beets. We have to try and figure out a mix that will work with the beets. Yeah, beets and amaranth. We sell a lot of bull's blood. So. Yeah. Yeah, so we've kind of perfected our soil mix. So that comes in, we go through a sack, a sack every two weeks, essentially. So we get a soil delivery every three months, um, just depending on production and, and yeah. obviously demand. So yeah, it's kind of been ideal. I know you spoke about buying a soil mix. I think once we scale into a bigger space, we can start. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it takes up quite a bit of space. Yeah, so it does. You it definitely does. need uh, uh, a little bit more space. But um, so for filling the, the the trays, it's it's like, is there? Do you guys have a system? For, yeah. So for that? we basically built our own little presses. Everything's okay, kind nice. of plastic. So these are little soil presses. Yeah. Just taking a awesome. food grade chopping board and chopped it to a ten twenty. Kind of flat. Yeah, no. Oh, and yeah. If it works, it works. Um, yeah. yeah, we got big a soil vat over here. Um, so for now, we're just doing hands. So yeah. we'll fill up a little two-liter jug, and we'll we'll, we'll pre-fill all our our flats. And yeah. Obviously, chuck it in. I know you guys have obviously all seen microgreens. We'll stomp it in, and then yeah, we kind of just pump out a bunch of those, um, and then. The day before, yeah, so we'll trays the day before. Yeah, it's gonna come close to the mic. So, so, so I see you're using the the tall trays here. Um, is there specific crops you you use these the the, the double height trays? Yes. yes. So we only use them for a few crops. We use them for peas because of the root systems are so big. Okay, and got we it. also cover our peas, and a lot of people don't, but we cover our peas because we deal with mold here in Florida. Mm -hmm. So oh, it true. really yeah. it really helps with the mold control. Um, so obviously with all that extra soil in the flat, it's just easier to plant them in two inch. We do the same thing for nasturtiums. Um, and then red what else? Soil. Red vein soil. Okay. The soil has a, needs a little bit more soil yeah. with the root system. And then everything else you're using, like the bootstrap yeah. style. Yeah, these yeah. all bootstraps. Yeah. Bootstrap yeah. uh, we just got our one inch, one. Yeah. Our one inch bootstraps here. Yeah. We actually just bought some of their mesh trays. We feel like those work better in our hydroponic system. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed earlier, I was going to ask you about yeah. that. Cats, you want to grab one of the mesh trays? We'll show them the difference. The bootstrap mesh just next oh, to the, okay. so yeah, just standard bootstraps, 1020s. Yeah. They work really well. Yeah. Um, a lot of those sit for our bottom watering that we're still hand watering. And then um, our, these bootstrap mesh trays are working really well in our hydroponic system. Um, they just kind of work yeah. a little bit better for drainage better and root drainage. development. How does uh, clean? How does, is cleaning those a pain? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen the new, Cam. new, yeah, Cam's are, Cam and Chris are master pressure washers. Nice. Um, but yeah, we we've uh, we in, we in comms with a bunch of different farmers. Obviously, yeah. our community is pretty small, so we've met some good people along the way, and uh, we've just seen one of our buddies up in Chicago um, from which Sasquatch? Justin from Sasquatch Farms. Okay, nice. Uh, yeah, they just invested in a prototype tray cleaner, which pumps out. Huge amount of trays. I know yeah. Bootstrap just made one as well, but yeah, these yeah. guys have kind of put more more money into a, a prototype which he's invested in, and it seems like that's the way forward. So again, with space and more space for our production facility, we'll probably invest in in-house soil, yeah. a bit of tray cleaner, and just stuff that would make more sense as we scale the business. Yeah, for sure. And it's really cool to see how many companies are starting to develop tools for migrant farms. Like it's right. really becoming an it's industry. True. Whereas, like you know, even just a few years ago there wasn't much you can buy. Yeah. There was a few pieces of equipment here and there, exactly. or you had to adopt greenhouse equipment exactly. for microgreens, but now there's specific equipment like the bootstrap tray cleaner exactly. that's for like the germ trays, it's, you know, whereas like a regular tray washer, because I do a lot of consulting and farms are looking for tray washers because no. no one wants to wash trays exactly. by hand anymore, exactly. which is totally it reasonable. Sucks. It sucks, yeah. It sucks. Um, but but the they cost like, but it's still time consuming. It's yeah, yeah. Well, it's nice here in Florida that you have the ability to do it outside because yeah. in the you know in Canada it's pretty damn cold in the winter exactly. so you can't yeah. do it outside. That's true. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so you, you, don't, you don't get too uh, too cold. But so, um, yeah, once we've kind of prepped our trays, we yep. do or today's a plante. Everyone's prepped up for a plante. We seed our twenty six varieties of microgreens, which we are going to streamline pretty soon. <laughs> uh, and yeah. we, we do different types of germination on the farm. Uh, this is our germ space. You can see we still got crops from our last plant that sits over here. Um, so yeah, this is actually cilantro. So yeah, we just oh, nice. weight germ up on our cilantros. It's kind of just about to push through. This is a Monday plant. Or yeah, Friday plant there'll be a few more days. Yeah. yeah. So this is our germ space. It's about to be very full after we plant today. Yeah. Um, I know you guys all know about dome germination as well. We do different types of germination. This is vermiculite. So this is our red and red and bicolor chiso. So we will soil seed. 
uh, obviously controls. We use Zertol and hydrogen peroxide. Nice. Then we'll throw some vermiculite on top of it, water it in, and then we mist by or every every couple of days just to keep your surface nice and moist. And yeah, yeah like I was saying to you earlier, we you found a new a new bicolored shiso seed that's uh, germinating faster than anything you'll ever believe that a shiso can do. So it's yeah. a more profitable crop. Yeah, great advice for anyone that's growing shiso. It's like you said, it was like. 27 to, days seed to harvest. Yeah. It's pretty cool for Shiso. It's a little cheaper. You can buy it from Haas. Yeah. yeah Haas yeah. is a great, great company. It's growing faster. Trade secrets, but we, we love sharing the knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, honestly, it comes back to you. Oh, yeah. yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's what I've we, learned. We, we, yeah. we try to help everyone where we can. We yes, should go recipes. Justin and, from Sasquatch told us about Haas and we've been yeah. buying some of the seed from Nice. Them. Yeah, great. check them out, Haas. Great Amazing. company. Um, yeah. they, they do well on shipping as well. I think three days and you have seed in, seed in your Seed in your farm, which is cool. That's amazing. Yeah, 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 that's great. So yeah, because we were a small space, this is kind kind of like our harvesting area. We try to yeah. keep our harvesting close to the door as well, so we kind of multi-purpose all our areas. So yeah, obviously with Gap, we keep everything super sanitary. We glove up. We got uh, PPE on. We put hairnets on. Everything's very very kind of controlled in terms yeah. of how we once harvest. You, once you do Gap, you got it. Got to really follow like the yeah. hygiene protocol. Keep your like, shit together. Very, yeah, very yeah. Exactly. Serious about that. That's yeah, like for primarily sure. Primarily, what they focus on, obviously, is food safety. Yeah. You know, certification. For so sure. For sure. human for sure. error is like the biggest thing that causes foodborne illness. So. For sure. <laughs> so yeah, well, we 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 do thirty-two ounce. We do sixty-four ounce. So four ounce and eight ounce clams. Uh, yeah. We do little pie shells. I don't know. This is also something we. Do you do any? Is there any retail product you do? Uh yeah. Let me quickly show you. These little chef tasting wheels are awesome. Um, oh yeah, I saw that on, on your Instagram. Yeah, those things are great. They're like, do you use that as for sale or for samples? More? We sell these a lot as well. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah, so yeah they're the when they're filled these. up, they're beautiful. Yeah, they're really yeah. cool, man. Um, we'll, we'll send you guys some pictures of these. So on a yacht, obviously refrigeration space is limited depending yeah. on, on the size of vessel. So instead of trying to sell someone 12 varieties of micros, we sell them two wheels and they've got a good variety of choice yeah. to pick from. Just, on a, just doing a one week trip or whatever, you know? Exactly, yeah. 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 Nice contained as well, so. Yeah, no, they, they look they look beautiful in those containers. And then I'm guessing it's also nice because you can kind of pick and choose what goes in there. Exactly. So, so that if you're short. Blends, um, yeah. Yeah, also, like you said, if we short along on some crops, if we have 20 extra flats of peas, we'll kind of push peas in a lot of our yeah. mixes and into those. We actually just started doing this for one of our wholesale clients as well. Um, they call it like a, oh, like named a it after a specific One chef, so it's the yeah. chef quad, so we'll do four <laughs> varieties of those. Nice. Made the chef feel special. Yeah. I'm sure he's got his own microgreen mix yeah. named after him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, no, I've noticed a lot of, um, a lot of farms that work closely with chefs, it's, it's about like the, it's the relationship with the chef is like the utmost important thing and doing those kind of, like we've had, uh, yeah. I, I did a podcast with uh, a farm in Utah, uh, Miko's Micro Farm. And they have like containers that are specially customized for chefs. So okay. each chef has like their own unique container, oh, that's and, and just like things like that that just create a special experience for the relationship and just builds the, the trust and the long term uh, loyalty that that you want when you're working with yeah, with yeah. Uh, customers chefs like that. Love it. You know, it's um, so, yeah, uh, that that too. That too. <laughs> I mean, obviously, we've had we've uh, we worked with a lot of uh, country club chefs, and uh, I don't know I just don't think we'd go through that effort because there's so much change in. Our wholesalers Chef go through the effort, which is exactly. nice. Like yeah. we get to be sort of a little bit separate from it. They they handle the chefs, and then we handle the microgreens. Yeah. And they deal with us, and it's kind of like a it's a nice symbiotic relationship. For sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah working working with um with distributors like was revolutionary for yes. for my farm. Yeah. And it sounds like the same like because it gets to a point where you have like chefs calling you all the time yeah. with different orders, and it's just yeah. like like it's it's like a, it's like. Yeah, it, it'll mess with your mind when you're trying to do so many other things. And then you have like 50, 60, 100, 200 orders uh, for different chefs. So having wholesalers to work with, it's oh. well it's well worth the cost of the, of the lower margin to have that higher volume and just easier yeah. life running yeah, the yeah, business. Exactly. Yeah. Even just distribution itself, like actually deliveries and pickups and all that, you're doing so much less of Man. you know getting around. Yeah. Know if any of you are familiar with the 95 here in South Florida, but driving from Miami to Palm Beach by week, you can... Put you in your grave. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not the most Quite fun. Yeah. Or figuratively, but both. I mean, yeah. so we've actually, I say both. Yeah. Even, <laughs> even outsourced some of our direct to consumer deliveries. You use a company called Rody. Okay. Um, if you guys check them out, I'm sure they're nationwide at this stage. Um, quite affordable for just single trips or multiple trips. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, called Rody. Okay, awesome. delivery yeah. service here as well. And then we just use yeah. Uber Package. Like man. Freelance and, service. Uh, it's really good. Yeah, if we're delivering to Palm Beach and a client orders four clams of microgreens, it makes more sense for us to. 
send it up in an Uber package and put the delivery fee on them because it's yeah. not really worth our time spending two hours in a car. Yeah. Uh, it just takes, like I said, takes away From our here. production time at the farm and just kind of doing what's what's most important for us is kind of for developing sure. farm that, activities and operations. Yeah. That's great that you guys are able to do that because, um, yeah, like I would imagine, like I, I was at a, a, a concert the other day and coming back, like the Uber was like $60 for like a 20 Nine minute drive. Surges, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so it, 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 I think it's everywhere. It's yeah. just, you know, Uber's pretty expensive and, and anywhere where labor's expensive. Yeah, but yeah, if you right. can get the customer to, to pay for it, then yeah. it's not on you guys. It doesn't affect your margin. So, exactly. yeah. We Especially do that yachts time. because they're usually like they're, yeah, yeah. they need something now and they don't care about the cost. Yeah. So it's they easier. do, but I mean, it's, yeah, it's not good. really. Not, not to the extent that not like the, extent that, the like, average consumer yeah. buying in a store Correct. would, yes. would yes. care. Yeah. 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 They'd, yeah. they'd rather like the convenience of it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then in terms of like, you have a, looks like three different types of grow setups right now. Correct. Yeah. Yes. We um, do. So I'd love to hear, that, like, I'm guessing it's like stage one, stage two, stage three, or yeah. is it, so is there, yeah. St stage one is kind of our hand watering, obviously what you'd see at any sort of microgreen farm. So, um, yeah, like we said, we started with two, two racks. We bought a 20 foot shipping container, then we bought two forties and obviously just scaled up with hand watering systems. And then it was, and we were out of the containers and a BMI bonnet nice. to automate the farm as we came yeah. kind of into a more of a commercial wholesale grow space. So we invested in. Kind of like a, a model here. This is from. This uh, is stage two, kind yeah, of. Yeah, this is stage two. So this yeah. is kind of our first developmental stage of uh, trying to figure out an ebb and flow and a system that works. Um, yeah. Are yeah. these custom made? These tables? Because um, I've never seen these before. Yeah. So this is actually a company from Alibaba. I've been shared the details oh, nice. with you guys as well. So okay. Yeah, we actually bought this off Alibaba, and you can custom make your your actual. Oh, that's amazing. Entry. So we actually, you see, we actually did the gluing ourselves. So just ah, uh, you still put it together. Yeah, okay. Send you in sections. Yeah, yeah. That's easy. That's just PVC. Glue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's yeah. great because then you can just make it whatever length Correct. you guys want, make which is amazing. Lengths. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, honestly, we just found that, you know, from a production side of things, this form of automation works kind of better for our for our, for our operation, our space. Wouldn't say I'd invest in another one of these. I'll talk you through our next stage of our. Mostly because of space. Like we feel like we have want to utilize this height oh, of our sure. ceilings. Yeah, and yeah. And this was a nice way to learn a, a bit about uh, flood and drain systems, yeah. and it was a simple one to learn. And For now, sure. this is a little bit more complicated, but it obviously makes much more sense with the height of this warehouse. Yeah. We're kind of moving in that direction. So yeah, three stages. Yeah. How yeah. tall? How tall the ceilings here? Sixteen foot ceilings, and okay, pretty much gone right to the top. Are um, they eighteen? 16, 16, 16, yeah. 16, yeah. If there's, yeah, that, that gives you, yeah, because like you think about it, you can literally double the production, the, the rest of the space you have here, yeah. similar to what's what's over there. So if we build four of those, we can do 2,000 flats. That's how wow, that's amazing. In 1,600 squares. So I don't yeah. know if you guys. Are, that's very, very efficient. It yeah. varies in terms yeah. of, of price points, but South Florida is super expensive for warehouse oh, space. Yeah. So yeah, our, our price with cam here is ridiculous. So we thought that going vertically would be better than trying to get another 2,000 squares yeah. to for sure. hand water a bunch of microgreens. Make this so, place work. Yeah. Good. yeah. And uh, you guys are doing some really cool stuff with uh, the automation you have going on there. I'd love to, to showcase that as Come well. Come on so over. Let's, let's take a, let's, let's let's take do a gander. It. So, so this is the this is this is version three. It looks like. So this is version three, and I think this is going to be version future. Um, uh, honestly, I just feel like you know, a lot of farmers kind of debate whether automation is the route to go with microgreen farming. Um, I think honestly, for us, with the system that we developed, uh, it makes sense for us to, like I said, scale vertically and also from a time standpoint. You know, we just water this entire rack once a day with yeah. all our different varieties, and we haven't had a single crop dampen off and we've kind of perfected the watering schedule for timing for the timing and Amazing. the system that works for us so we have to share the knowledge on that as well and uh it took time you know it's like a little trial oh, and yeah. error. it's really like there's a learning curve uh, i also almost time. almost lost my wife building this but uh, <laughs> that, that happens too um hell so yeah <laughs> quickly talk you through the, the process um you know as a scaling farm and operation we we always try to affordably scale without having to over invest and overcapitalize. so Everything here is second hand. We bought a used pallet rack from a supply company down here, which was pretty affordable. Yeah. Um, I managed to find these Botanica low tide trays, which are actually rack trays. Um, they fit perfectly on a 42 inch rack. So we got those at a pretty good deal. 
Uh, we got these uh, LEDs, these eight foot tube Philips LEDs, which generally cost about $210 a light. Managed to pick them up for about 40 bucks a piece, oh, which wow. uh, was an absolute game changer for us. Um, I won't say it was an easy process. Me and Chris had to drive up to Orlando and spent a day, multiple times, uh, multiple times spent a day <laughs> cutting out solenoids of a rotting farm. Uh, oh, I think wow. I was covered in feces and uh, that's nice. E. coli and whatever was floating around pipes. And <laughs> Anyways, regardless, cleaned everything. Now up. it's clean though. Yeah, well, yes, these, these trays yeah. are actually all clean. Yeah, yeah. We just, yeah, yeah. just the solenoids that we actually broke apart and, and yeah. desanitized and everything. It was just a farm that was it was a it's, gone under yeah, sitting for yeah. months. And everything was filled with like old gunk, gunk and water. And yeah, I mean, crazy, crazy operation. The most impressive indoor farm I've ever seen. Um, and actually, the last three they built, one was in San Diego. Um, one was in Texas. There's a lettuce though, they're doing lettuce. Yeah, we're doing, uh, yeah, okay, okay, like, got it, got it. Le lettuce is yeah. actually the last three facilities that they spent seven million dollars a piece on, never yeah. managed to even produce a piece of lettuce. So that's how quickly they overcapitalized. So it, it's funny how, um, the, the vertical farming industry got so much funding, yeah, like Aero Farms and mm -hmm. all these farms, and um, and the ones that are left. Are all the microgreens farms that are booming and, exactly. and, and growing yeah, even exactly. during this like rut of the vertical farming industry right. in, 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 as as a whole where it's kind of investment has slowed down people are more cautious now but microgreens farms are booming like i haven't heard of a microgreens farm that's not expanding like yeah. they're all expanding yeah, which yeah. is which is really great and We've you guys are expanding very fast so we yeah. have some good ones here in south florida too there's some other good farms i feel like there's there's so many people that live here. There's so many. Yeah. There's so many people to serve. Your like there's really there's a big market, so we big don't really feel in competition with the farms here. Like we have good relationships with the farms here, so yeah, it's nice. Yeah, it's nice it's to good, have that. It's good to have a, a community that's building as well, because there's a lot more knowledge around microgreens, and I think as people become more aware of the products, the health benefits, and from a chef's perspective side of thing, uh, you know the 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 utilization of beautiful little garnish greens. Yeah. Um, yeah. The more awareness around our products, the the more. Uh, developed our industry will become so yeah it's nice to kind of be on that upside of the growth of the microgreen business yeah, it is. oh yeah it's yeah, nice. it's nice. yeah i did i did a uh, video is going to be coming out shortly that i did uh like just like market trends in microgreens mm -hmm. and when i started my farm on google trends it goes from zero to 100 on how popular something is at a given time yeah so when i started in 2013 it was about six out of 100 microgreens okay. and now it's 75 out of 100 wow. so you're talking about like multiple multiple wow yeah uh increase yeah. in, in, yeah, in yeah. growth exactly. in, in the decade and and i foresee that just to keep happening because exactly. yeah. like you know people were worried it's a fad it's definitely not a fad no, it's yeah, definitely a sure. trend yeah Same. you want to make some money start finding something you can supply my green farmers with and ditch the growing yeah yeah seriously <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Right. i'm like it's not a get rich quick scheme yeah. or, it's not but yeah. no there's there's it's a lot of work yeah i know for sure yeah I, I don't think uh anyone that thinks my greens is like a get rich get rich quick uh, thing is, is yeah like it's easy to start it's very yeah. easy to start my yeah, business true. but it's a lot harder to scale exactly. and that, that's where having the information and working with with people that have done it or or reaching out to people like you guys that you know have done it uh, makes it so much easier to see like okay save the time don't try to reinvent the wheel someone's yeah. already done it yeah. and uh, and and get advice from people that that have already built a successful micro sure. business yeah For sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll quickly talk you through the rack. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, each of these load types holds 16 flats. So yeah. In total, we are 450 flats just on uh, this rack alone. So if we can do this four times over, we will get close to 2,000 flats of micros in the farm space, which is kind of where we want to be at. Yeah. Um, I'll quickly talk you through the uh, kind of brains behind the operation. Oh, so we're just using a Helios 18, which is essentially just a transformer. Um, and then we're just running two timers. Um, Got it. So yeah, we're 16 on eight off light cycle. That's pretty much working well for all our yep. micros. Uh, obviously, we just turn all our fans off right now, but we just built our own uh, oh, interesting. A ventilation system. So basically, we have your Terra Blooms. This is the inline 10 inch fan. Um, these things are super powerful, man. So what we've done is we've taken 10 inch ducting, um, just strapped the fan onto the top of the ducting here, and then we've done some little cross fingers. Very cool. With um, some holes in the yeah, bottom. basically some, basically some, uh, uh, yeah, it's basically tubing. Yeah, it's hydroponic tubing that have holes inside them. Wow. So pretty much every layer has a good amount of airflow. Um, obviously, running a bunch of fans is just a nightmare because they take a floor space. So you're yeah. trying to plug them in and clean them or whatnot. So we just felt like this would be the most efficient way to airflow vertically as well. We have one here and we have another one there, uh, so it runs 
runs the top and then this one runs these yeah bottom i'll kind of show you the inside so basically we, we had to take out the bottom three over there yeah, over there just that. to kind of in-house yeah. our water tank systems and our pumps and kind of our, our the, the brain side of running our solenoids. Yeah, for sure, which is really cool. I'm excited to, to show people yeah, that because I think it's very unique. We'll give us two, uh, this is a bit of view of all our solenoids. So each flat is labeled, as you can see. So we yeah. got one, two, three, all the way down to 27. And each flat runs on its own. This is basically like a, a solenoid. Yeah. So each solenoid can be controlled by our uh, control panel, which we'll show you now shortly. And then, yeah, we just ran all this PVC. We've got supply and drain. Um, so... Once the system's pressurized, you basically hit the solenoid and that'll open up the valve. Yeah. Um, I'll quickly show you an example. When we walked down here, I'll quickly show yeah. you how, how it all works. Awesome. And these flood tables, for anyone that's looking to, to automate, these are by far the best design. These are Botanicare, right? Yeah, Botanicare. Um, because you they can see they, they have a, a spot where the water can drain into that's much lower than the actual table itself. So this, this will allow, even if, you're even if your racking isn't perfectly flat, will still allow the water to drain out really, really well. So um, very, very smart that you guys went with these ones because yeah. I actually haven't seen these in 4 8 before or anyone using them. So, so that's basically, really great. The difference in these is a low tide tray sits perfectly on a 42-inch rack. Your typical uh, paddle rack system is 48 inches. So you just yeah. got to make sure you bind the right rack Got it. for the pallet rack trays. But that's, all the specs on Botanic Air trays as well. Yeah, really good advice. I appreciate yeah, that. We actually, that, that could be an expensive mistake. Well, funny enough, we yes. bought these and we, we initially tried to like conceptualize uh, the idea on that. And yeah, obviously yeah. The, the trays were too small for the rack. So we got it. It's, it's learned by, learned by, uh, by fault. So that's great that you got to reuse them though. So Correct. they didn't go to waste. Yes. Yeah. Also, I'll quickly show you what we've done here to build our system. So basically, on these pads, we've got two drainage and a supply. Um, I'll yeah. show you the pumps that we use. So we've also basically controlled with uh, these Botanica little switches. We can control on or off. our drainage, oh, that's drainage. Okay. and we can control our supply. So I know yeah. we water everything once a day, but say, for example, we're growing amaranth on tray 22 and we're growing cilantro on tray 24. I can actually control the amount of water flow that comes into uh, amaranth essentially so it'll full slower and it can drain faster essentially so we still have control of every flat yeah just by kind of controlling solenoid That's inputs great. Yeah. and then drainage output as well awesome That's um, perfect. and then yeah we've kind of just replicated all the way up um here is the brains behind the system over here so this is just our standard basically we just we keep a cover on top of our because a lot of these tanks you buy yeah, yeah, it's like an IBC tote. Yeah, it's IBC tote. Yeah. So we just cover it just to stop any sort of uh, algae blooms in there as well. So this is the brains behind the situation. Yeah, this is. I'm actually going to show you guys how it works. So we have two pumps. We've built a backup pump as well. So if one of our pumps fails, we can essentially just shift our pump. Ah, uh, that's smart. Over that to pump two, smart. turn pump one off, yeah. just unscrew. We've got these clever valves. We can just do any work on the system as well. Um, so yeah, let's do, I'll show you how quickly this works. This is flat number 23. Yeah. So basically come to our control system over here, which we're going to actually fully automate right now. We'll turn our solenoid on and then we can turn pump our on. pump on. And then it'll show start, you how quickly it'll start filling up. Yeah, it's impressive how fast they fill up. That's, that's one not thing even, that's, that's really nice sorry, about. Not, now it's going to go. There we ah, go. Okay. So I had the wrong pump on. Yeah, they fill in about, uh, I think it's about a minute. Yeah, yeah. that's a minute and ten or a minute fifteen. We yeah. them run and then it's time to them. Yeah, th those are some big pumps for yeah. sure. Like they're they're definitely uh, a good size. Well, obviously, good size the higher you go, it's funny. true. Yeah, the yeah, ones at the top full slower than the ones at the bottom do. Yeah, that's a good point. Gravity. Yeah. So yeah. It's still, it's still really very quick. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, it's 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 very very fast. So do you usually water one at a time, or do you do like multiples at we a time? We can do three at a time, but I yeah. just feel like one at a time is just easier. We have a system over here. Just uh, got our, it farm manager actually came up with this whole situation so basically look at all our numbers we label them from 1 through 27 so we know what lot number and what's in every flat perfect so yeah we know what we harvest and then our and we AMPM kind of, water waters so you know, yeah do. so morning and evening waters nice okay so the, the it's you but th this means that it's done or does that yes, mean that done. okay okay, okay. So, so and then they get watered again uh, before you guys leave no so we just once a day once a day yeah, yeah. Exactly. you can see how quickly these yeah. fall i mean that's, that's like crazy a, yeah sometimes the crop might not need a morning water so we'll just it may need it yeah yeah for sure so yeah that's how quickly they yeah, go that's incredible. And, then, and then in terms of so you're, you're not putting any nutrients in the soil using nutrients in the water correct so we've actually just started introducing uh, biofungicide and uh, um, mycorrhizae into our soil yeah but yeah we don't actually do too many soil nutrients 
but we well, yeah, we would, like you said. I mean, you you start introducing yeah into so kind of saves having to add nutrients. Yeah, I mean, like you know, unless you unless you're growing longer growth crops off over twelve days, like our basils, our shisas, our sorrels, that's stuff that needs nutrients. But if you're doing yeah, you know, any of your standards, broccolis, kohlrabis, or all the fast growers don't necessarily need too many more nutrients. I mean, I'm sure there's this. Can add some, but I mean, I feel like we harvest them so quickly. Yeah, for sure. What, what I always suggest for for farms is just like like the, the fertilizer I use that I've had the best experience with is the Gaia Green Four for Four. It's an yeah, organic yeah. fertilizer I've that it, yeah that I've just it, recommended. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's pretty pretty easily available, which is yeah. also uh, great because it, it was a small Canadian company and then they got bought up by Hydro Farm and now they're everywhere. Gotcha. And it's it's a great fertilizer. I would just do side by side testing yeah, where exactly. uh, and then just see because you may find like wow we're actually getting 20, 30 percent higher yields. Maybe yeah. not, but just if you do the testing, then you know. Oh, yeah. And then if you're getting that, that also allows you to get more production in the same space before expanding. 100%. Which that I think is the biggest, mm -hmm. especially for like uh, from what I hear from Cassie, it, it like doing this is a lot. It's a yeah, lot it's of work. Lot. Sure. So so if you if you can just change a soil formula yeah. and all of a sudden get 20% higher yields, that yeah. means if you have 2,000 trays, you're getting the equivalent of like I don't know whatever 2,400 or, or something yeah. like that. We're really yeah. open to running trials pretty much with anything. Yeah, ever, yeah. So it would be cool to. I'm really, I really want to get the fertilizer thing under control because so this has changed a lot. Sun pumps and all the medical. Yeah, yeah. all good, all good. This yeah, has yeah. changed a lot, and like this, just the cleaning of this tank and having to put, you know, fertilizer inside the water. Yeah, I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a lot. Yeah, no, for sure, totally, you know? totally get that. So if we could put yeah. it in the soil, I think that would be. Yeah, which we can do, like we said. Nice yeah, change. it's worth it to try. Yeah, yeah it's and then. A shot. And then, uh, yeah, like a, like some of the soil mixing machines are very small. Like you yeah. can easily fit some of the smaller yeah, ones like in that corner. Yeah, like a like a cement mixer, so to say. Yeah, well, that, that that's I haven't found those work super super well, but you can't you can't yeah. like that's definitely the cheapest size, way to go. Size, size, but size for like eight, about eight thousand Canadians, so I don't know six thousand five hundred US, there's like a smaller one. It's not like super automated because like it doesn't have a conveyor belt, so you have to manually push it through. Yeah. Uh, but they're it's very compact. Sure. Um, so that that's also an option cool. before you expand that. It would only take up like I think four feet in storage yeah. wide and then like six feet tall. So it's not uh, it's not because the the one we had was like it was it was big, right? Because yeah. it's got yeah. a conveyor belt and then it could fit like three bales worth of soil okay, in it. Yeah. So you can fill like you know, like a hundred trays at a time, or or something exactly. like that, or even more. We're always uh, worried about space. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But to be honest, the, when you have a soil mixing machine, it definitely gets dustier in yes, your space. So, that's true. Um, but what's nice about being in Florida is that you could take the soil mixing machine outside, do it out there. True. You know, you know, I know it rains a lot here, yeah, but for sure. Yeah, yeah you guys, me. that that's really one thing that's really nice about having. It's gonna make friends with the neighbors. Farm. Yeah. <laughs> we have really good friends. We're really good friends with our neighbors. Here. That's yeah. amazing. They rent, they rent us a forklift like once. I'll quickly yeah. show you through our kind of hand watering. Yeah. Options. Yeah. as well so yeah we just do our, our, our famous shovel we've been talking about oh yeah oh it looks beautiful, beautiful wow yeah there. that's beautiful so yeah we just kind of focus on more of our you know our opal basils i mean this is the bicolor she said we're yeah. growing you could i'll show you the one on the rack earlier look how different it is under these lights yeah compared to yeah top the canopy colors, as well. colors very very different yeah that's one of the benefits of the the blurple lights is is it definitely adds Correct. for certain crops I've been doing some testing with it, but yeah. uh, it, it depends on how much. Because like, there's full spectrum lights like these. These are LED, right? Yeah, those are yeah. The, the so there's full spectrum that are much more on the blue and uh, red, yellow and green yellow, side, yeah. and then there's some that still look white, like the ones over there that might have more red in them yeah. than. So so the more red it has, uh, generally I found the faster the growth, the more blue it has. Um, often can can especially like the specific 460 nanometer mm -hmm. blue, the more. Um, Purple, gotcha. the, the crops will have, which is nice. But there's some like amaranth that doesn't matter what, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what lights you're using, and they're going to be beautiful and, and sure. nice and purple. Yeah, for sure. For um, sure. One thing I'd love to ask before we wrap up is about um, the gap certification, because I know there's a lot of farms that are getting to the point where they want to potentially get gap certified. I'd, lo I'd love to hear like, you know, what your experience is with gap certification. How Difficult is it? How time consuming is it to get? And would you recommend farms that want to scale up to get? I think I would to definitely it? recommend it. I, I, I mean, it was hard. I, it was a hard thing to to complete. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of resources available, and also a lot of people that want to help. So there's other farms that, like for for instance, if anybody wanted to go forward with it, I could give as much help as possible. I really would. Yeah, I will help people go through it, and it's really just a lot of. It's a lot of HACCP. It's a lot of, you know, paperwork. 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 Yeah. And yeah. getting your paperwork right is how you pass GAP. Yeah, for sure. And getting your, like the procedures, you're probably already doing 
99% of the stuff that just you logging. need to do, yeah. except you're not writing it down. Yeah. And that's really what you realize when you're like, oh, wow, we needed to log for months. That's why it took us months because we really needed to start getting these logs done and procedures. the procedures of logging is just like, it it's takes crazy. a lot. Yeah. It's SOPs on a daily basis as well. You yeah, know, having we, a good it, standard operating procedure like a food safety plan yeah. and creating your food safety plan and having a food safety officer, which I am now. Nice. Okay. <laughs> 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 and getting your staff trained and yeah, it's and then doing the audit itself was a little nerve wracking. Yeah. But the auditors want you to pass. Yeah. They really want to have more farms on board with GAP, so they want you to pass and they want you to do the right thing, so they're going to help you. Look, I think yeah. microgreens fall under the leafy greens category. You know, we've had a we're in a high risk category. High risk, yeah. Food, Spinach, food, obviously. Illness smashed the industry a couple of years back and I don't think they've really recovered many, from many, that. Many, yeah, yeah, there's lots yeah. of, yeah, there's been lots. But of honestly, many. just from, you know, from seed to harvest, you know, everything that we do now is a controlled, a control point, essentially, yeah. and everything's logged. So, you know, that kind of eradicates human error. You know, there's always human error, obviously, but, you know, we, we're wearing PPE. We it minimizes it. Like, yeah, like, as much as we're you can. On the lowest, we're on the lowest risk end of a high-risk industry. Yeah. Correct. That's what they, the, our, we got a consultant, she helped us kind of, Put our paperwork together. I gladly um, share contact information. She's amazing, <laughs> Amy. You're the woman. <laughs> she, honestly, she helped us so much. Yeah, she no, really. for sure. Because it's it's a lot to learn. Yeah. Like you yeah. know, it's the same thing when I got certified organic. I, I did like I was back then in the mindset do everything myself. Yeah. Obviously, that's that's changed a lot. Um, but <laughs> yeah. uh, I I was like I can't do this. Alone. Yeah, I no. Need help. Yeah, it it, get, it can get very especially with with gap and in Canada, microgreen farms can't get gap anymore they have to get HACCP which is gotcha. like yeah. next level so you it, you really need someone that's an expert um or, or guidance in some in For some sure. capacity like I, I don't know that I stuff but HACCP there's lots of them. but we didn't need to have uh, a HACCP certification for the farm we just needed somebody here to be certified in HACCP so basically it's basically a food certification. safety officer yeah. on property all the time so oh, wow. if anything happens here I would be responsible for it's it. It's one of the prerequisites to GAP. So you have to have a certified HACCP. Oh, okay. So Cassie did the full 20 hour course, did all the exams yeah, and everything. And so, so, wow. She, she's so, a so, it's, so it's definitely a lot then. Like the overall is like, it's a lot. But having said that, the industry in general, just like food in general, produce, like more and more people are requiring GAP certification. Yeah, and right. I think that trend also will Especially continue. Wholesale. Yeah, because wholesale they're is, yeah. Big distribution, so they need to go work with farms definitely. that are using you know, safety procedures that yeah. they agree with essentially that are keeping their clients safe and they're vouching for us. Yeah. And honestly, the safer food is, the better it is for everyone. So I think I think everybody should go for it if they're going to scale yeah, their farm. Good. Yeah, That's for good. sure. And it provides a lot more opportunity to work with wholesalers because they see that mm -hmm. and not that many farms, at least now, are getting the gap certification. So it kind of can give you a unique advantage in your local market. Does. Well, yeah. Yeah. So we're on the small scale side of farming. So yeah. But even it, still, any of our big wholesalers it's a prerequisite to do a vendor onboarding for any of our wholesalers. Yeah. So. Now, well, yes, yes, now it is. I mean, they yeah. can give you a grace period as long as you can show that you're working towards Gap. I think one of our main wholesalers gave us like a three-month grace period, but then we had to jump onto what's the system that we had to log on to? Azul. Azul. That's a whole other ball game. Is Azul? You have to get Azul registered as well. That kind of goes with the with whole Gap, GAP yeah. protocol. Yeah, a, a lot to it. Um, she's our food safety it's a lot Gap to officer. It, but I think it's definitely achievable. Yeah, sure. yeah, and, and I think and it's get, worth in the long help. run. Yeah, yeah, don't yeah no, for like sure. Don't feel like you have to do it all by yourself. Yeah, nobody would. You wouldn't know where to begin. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot. I remember, like, I remember when I was considering getting it for for a living earth farm. It was it was just like it was. I had so much going on. We were expanding, going through a huge expansion, and I was like, this is the last thing I want to do right now. So looking back, I should have hired a consultant that specializes in Gap or HACCP. And just get them to create the plan, pay whatever you know it costs. Like it's it's not going to be yeah, cheap. Yeah, they work with you on creating yeah. the plan because obviously, yeah. Amy, who helped us, she's in Tennessee. She's not here all the time. She came to our farm and she did a farm visit. Oh, that's but, nice. So we did like a floor plan, sort of. You know, she knew what the farm looked like. She helped us organize the farm so that the farm was food safe, which that was something that really we important. weren't aware of. Like yeah, you yeah. Couldn't keep things on top of these microgreen racks you know what i mean like mm -hmm. every, nothing can be above your microgreens yeah yeah so that was something so we just had to reorganize the farm um yeah. move these use but then she worked with us pipes, we had lots so. of conversations about procedures protocol and basically how we were running the farm every day so it's i don't know it you learn a lot when you're 
learn a lot about your own farm. When do, it. do it. Yeah. Do it. Do yeah. it. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm an advocate. I'm an advocate. Yeah, no, for <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you guys did it. And now, now you know, now it's done. Exactly. And exactly. then, you know, it's just following the procedures, which yeah. I think, if anything, that's the easy part. Yeah. Yes, you know, it is, it, yeah. making the plan and, and changing, making the changes to uh, operating business, especially as you're trying to grow, can be difficult. Yeah. But once you have it in place, easy peasy, you just, you just follow follow the follow the plan. Yeah. Absolutely. And then the last thing I wanted to ask you guys about was expansion plans. So you guys have been growing very, very fast um, the last, like in three years. It's, it's very, very incredible <laughs> how much, slow us down yeah, so that, that, yeah, so I'd love to hear like, you know, and slowing down is not a bad thing. So yeah. it, it might be yeah. to reassess how to make things more efficient and, Look, you know. At the end of the day, without POs, there's no need to expand. So it's, it's all about getting a purchase orders. It's all about, you know, getting those wholesale clients that are putting in weekly orders. So yeah scalability happens when you have the demand so i'm all about like let's move and let's shake and let's have the ability to bring on new wholesalers yeah whereas Which we, do. We, do. we do as well yeah. but cassie's more of a let's secure more wholesale wholesale clients and scale with the demand which which you know hand in hand we, we work well together and that's um, i mean um, it's the same thing you just said really. yeah it is but he um, just pushes harder for more more more, more. Yeah. i'm more aggressive yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. at the end of the day, man, we you know we 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 have overheads. We have you know, like I say, warehouse sure. space is super expensive. Our electric yeah. bills expensive. We have labor costs. You know, we have soil seeds, like everything that goes into a farm. You know, we could we could be turning over high revenues, but you know, your profit margins aren't there if you're not For sure. really dialing in your operations. Yeah, and, yeah. To expand it to warehouse space double the size would cost us an extra three grand a month. So that's not really within our budget right now. So yeah. like I said, I think. We want another one of these racks, but not for a year. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to work with what we have. We're well, going to stop building one in the summer. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. You guys, will, I, no. I, you, you, I can tell you guys work well together. You'll find some. You'll be in the middle. Exactly. Yeah, we'll find some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Middle, yeah. yeah. We'll start in the summer. Yeah. yeah. We. Uh, awesome. We are expanding, but we're. I think we're we're slowing. We're we're steady right now. Like, yeah, we're, we're, we're in good. a good space. We're good. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me at the farm. This has been wonderful you, um, to, to see the farm, the automation, like the, the iterations, I think is really something that people can take away is like, you know, you're not going to have the perfect system day one, but you start with, with what you got here, version one, you go to, you know, version two, where you got the flowers, and then eventually you will get to version three and have uh, a more automated facility. So, you know, just motivation for some people that you know, maybe like, oh my God, how do I do this? This is so much. Like it takes, you do it in stages. It doesn't happen overnight. Yep. And and you guys are living proof that you can do it. And it just takes time and, and hard work and maybe not that much time based on how fast you guys have done it. So <laughs> um, yeah, congratulations on, on expanding. You. And you we're actually much. just about to start our YouTube channel. We're going to do free tutorials on flow systems, on seed to harvest, on all our crops. Uh, maybe Gap. <laughs> Gap, Castle, we'll do Gap Talks as well. Uh, we actually just started our YouTube. So stay tuned for uh maybe we'll send you a link and that you can take yeah in, yeah in i'll put video. i'll put it in the show notes for yeah sure. we start our youtube yeah. channel and just kind of provide some free information i think it's important to share share the knowledge between us farmers so yeah i love that the collaboration true. is is it's so beautiful to see in the microgreens industry yeah, how that's forming and just yeah the more that's out there the the better people can operate their farms and you know people aren't competition people are other human beings that want right. to grow their businesses too yep. and there's lots more benefit of collaboration than doing everyone is competition so amazing. i love that you guys have that view so yeah again thanks so much for having me here and and we'll see you again soon appreciate you thank you so much <laughs>